Good afternoon. We'll resume our hearing. I apologize for the delay for all of you. Mr. Holman, uh, you are now recognized for your opening speech. Thank you. Uh, I guess sitting in for Chairman, Chairman Jordan and uh, members of the subcommittee, good afternoon and thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today. My name is Keith Holman and I am the Deputy Director of the National Lime Association. NLA is the trade association for manufacturers of calcium oxide and calcium hydroxide, commonly known as lime. So just to clear up any misconceptions, uh, we are not the green little citrus fruit and we are not uh, associated with Lyme disease. For the lime industry, particularly our smaller companies, EPA's greenhouse gas rules are having a big impact. Lime plants generate CO2 emissions both from the fuel that they use and from the, what you could call the roasting process that converts limestone into lime. All lime plants are now subject to greenhouse gas permitting requirements when they are modified. So even though the GHG rules took effect only three months ago, we are already seeing a chilling effect on plans to modernize or expand lime plants because of great uncertainties surrounding GHG permitting. The U.S. lime industry is comprised of some 20 companies operating about 50 commercial lime plants. Nearly half of NLA's members are small businesses. These small lime companies face intense competition, and they are particularly sensitive to increases in regulatory costs. For this reason, when EPA planned a Clean Air Act rulemaking back in 2002 that would impose stringent new requirements on lime plants, NLA was able to persuade EPA to convene what is known as a Small Business Advocacy Review Panel under the Regulatory Flexibility Act. NLA wanted EPA to have the opportunity to meet with small lime companies, understand their needs, and design the rule with those needs in mind. EPA convened the Lime Panel in January of 2002. Seven of the nine lime companies potentially affected by the rule participated in the panel process. These small lime companies met with EPA twice, including a face-to-face -face meeting in Washington, D.C. The companies were able to talk directly to EPA, as well as to with representatives of the Office of Advocacy and with the White House Office of Management and Budget. Because of the panel process, the final rule was tough, but something that our small lime plants could live with. Several improvements to the rule were only made possible because small lime companies were able to meet face to face with EPA and provide critical information. Not surprisingly, when EPA announced in 2008 that it planned to regulate GHGs under the Clean Air Act, many industries, including the lime industry, wanted EPA to convene a panel. However, instead of convening a panel, EPA simply chose to have a public outreach meeting and only after it had proposed three rules under GHG program, the first, the endangerment finding, the vehicle tailpipe rule, and the so-called tailoring rule. EPA argued that it was not required to conduct a panel for these rulemakings. Whether or not EPA could legally choose not to convene a panel, it was clearly wrong not to do so. EPA held the panel meeting in November of 2009, well after the three GHG rules had been proposed. The meeting was in reality little more than EPA giving attendees a broad brush overview of the proposed rules. NLA and the other trade associations that were present had virtually no opportunity to have a dialogue with the agency about the actual design of the rules. NLA followed up the meeting with written comments to EPA about the design of the tailoring rule. The tailoring rule proposed to defer GHG permitting requirements for plants, plants that had GHG emissions below a certain threshold, because there is no known way to avoid generating CO2 when limestone is heated and converted to lime. NLA asked that EPA consider excluding these process-related GHG emissions from counting against the tailoring rule's applicability thresholds. EPA's single paragraph re response failed to meaningfully respond to EPA's request. EPA's reliance on the public outreach approach as a substitute for the panel process is wrong for several reasons. In bypassing the panel process, EPA lost its best chance to meet with actual small businesses face-to-face -face and exchange information with them. The panel process also establishes a context for EPA, advocacy, and OMB to meet, discuss the issues, and reach consensus on flexible solutions. 
The public outreach approach taken by EPA does not and cannot take the place of a panel. Many of the implementation difficulties now facing EPA, the States, and industry might have been avoided if EPA had taken the time to listen to small business before writing its GHG rules. Now the lime industry as a whole is reluctant to expand or modernize its plants until the permitting uncertainties caused by these GHG rules have been resolved. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Holman. Um, oh, okay. Thank you. At this time, uh, without objection, I would like to enter into the record. Um, let's see, we have got testimony from the National Association of Home Builders. the Farm Bureau Federation and the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council, without objection, so ordered. At this point, I am going to yield myself five minutes and uh, see if some of the other subcommittee members join us. Um, and, and correct me if I am saying your name incorrectly, Mr. It is Rakovats. Rakovats. Thank you. In your testimony, um, you mentioned the, e the EPA taking a one-size-fits-all approach. And I wonder if you could expand upon that a little bit. Yes. We fundamentally believe without having uh, included uh, small businesses, uh, small business uh, motor carriers, owner-operators in the discussion. And when I say they didn't include it, they, within their regulatory impact analysis, they specifically stated that there was uh, the rulemaking would not have a significant economic impact on a substantial number of small entities. And uh, as, as we started looking at that, we were aware that they were talking with uh, large motor carrier interests, and this gets to the heart of the problem in terms of looking at the trucking industry. The industry is predominantly uh, dominated by small business motor carriers. Nearly 96 percent of motor carriers operate, registered motor carriers in this country have 20 or fewer trucks that they operate. And yet when you go and talk to the largest of the large who have very homogenous, streamlined operational models, they run one truck, one type of trailer, it fails to take into account the multiple dual purpose uses that small businesses actually engage in. We have many members uh, that operate a couple of trailers. They may one day pull a dry van trailer, for instance, where aerodynamic technologies would be appropriate and work. We don't deny that these technologies will work where appropriate, but the next day they are pulling a flatbed or a drop deck, and in that, now that technology is working against them. Thank you. Um, Mr. Doniger, in your comments uh, earlier before we adjourned, you made the statement that you hoped that members of Congress wouldn't uh, fall prey to the phony storylines of small businesses uh, when it comes to EPA burdens uh, placed on them. Uh, could you expand on what were you referring to? If I may, I was referring to a phony storyline about small businesses that is generally told by others, by, large, by lobbyists for larger entities. And the common storyline is that EPA's regulations uh, affect apartment houses, hot dog stands, donut shops, small entities. And they don't. There is a specific exemption, as I explained, and I am sure you will hear from EPA, and as uh, Mr. Kucinich explained, that the permit requirements don't apply to 95 percent of the sources in the country. They don't apply to the kinds of sources that emit less than 75,000 tons a year of carbon pollution. And as a result, uh, this storyline that millions of sources are being, of tiny sources, are being roped into a government bureaucracy is the very opposite of what is true. Thank you. I have about a minute and a half left, and I would like to give each of the other three members of the panel the opportunity to respond to that. Well, if the tailing rule is followed and allowed, it would provide an exemption for some small emitters of CO2 for a few years. But even the EPA says that uh, eventually it is going to cover uh, entities uh, requiring just for Title V permits, 6 million new entities will be, uh, have to be permitted. 
So the, the tailing rule is just putting it off for a few years. Thank you. Go ahead. As far as affecting small businesses, as EPA's rulemaking goes through in its current form, there are millions, literally millions of trucks that operate interstate commerce in this country. As I stated, most of them are small businesses. That means eventually this rule affects millions of small businesses. Thank you. Mr. Holman? Yes, I would agree that the, uh, the tailoring rule is only a, a, a partial temporary solution for small businesses. And we don't know what EPA is going to do at the end of the period of deferral, which will end in a few years. We also don't know, uh, EPA is interested in writing other programs that are going to apply to small businesses. So we are we're in a very large uh, and a comprehensive and wide-reaching wide regulatory program in the climate arena. And uh, certainly from the standpoint of you know, looking at what the impacts are of that program, EPA has done not a particularly good job. Thank you. At this time, I am pleased to uh, recognize our chairman from Ohio. I yield you five minutes. I thank the, uh, thank the gentlelady. I didn't know if, if the ranking member was, he was in the room. We can certainly let. Well, I will ask a few questions. I think Dennis will be fine, and we will give him, if he wants a little longer time, we will be happy to do that. Uh, let me again thank you all for being here, and I apologize, all my notes are at Anne Marie's desk there. But let me just do a, a couple things. Um, uh, Dr. Kreutzer, uh, let, let me first ask you about the um, talk to me a little bit more about the cap and trade uh, bill and what EPA may be doing and how that relates. You, you mentioned this some in your testimony, but if you can, um, if you can elaborate on that, uh, I would appreciate that. And then I do have a question for Mr. Holman. Um, and then a general question, I think, for If you cut CO2 emissions, if you force them to be reduced, you are going to cut fossil fuel use. Fossil fuel is the affordable energy right now. Fifty percent of our electricity comes from coal, 20 percent from, from natural gas. And in my uh, written testimony, I should, did a cost comparison showing that uh, the renewables are 80 to 280 percent more expensive. That restricts economic activity. It means consumers have less money to spend on other things once they have paid their utility bills. It means producers have higher costs of production. So if you have consumers with less money and you are forcing you have to have higher cost products, they are going to buy less of it. You need less, fewer people to make that. So employment goes down as well. It doesn't matter if it is a tax that you do. It doesn't matter if it is a cap. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you come up with a complex set of regulations to force the same reduction. You are going to have those costs. With regulation, it is even more costly because you have the compliance of the administrative costs as well um, and the, the 6 million permits that the EPA said they, they would have to issue for the mm -hmm. Title V permits. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Rockabotz, is that pretty close? Yes. Let me, let me ask you this. this. This came up in a hearing we had in this room uh, a couple weeks ago. We had a uh, Mr. Michaels from uh, OSHA. And I asked him this question. I, I would just, in the course of the, the hearing, um, I just, I guess I sort of picked up on this and, and asked him this general question. I would like your thoughts uh, as to how you, you, you see the, uh, the small business folks that, that you work with, uh, how, how they might feel about this. I asked the gentleman the question. I said, uh, Mr. Michaels, uh, you, you, would you agree with me that the vast majority of cases, um, employers care pretty deeply about their employees? I mean, they're the, they're the, they invest time in, 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 in training them. They are the key to their success, uh, making a profit. Uh, they know them. They may live in the same community. And I said, you know, there there's always exceptions. But I, I, I asked him, I said, wouldn't you agree that in most situations employers care deeply about the well-being of their employees? And I was struck by the gentleman's response. Um, he said, I'd like to think so. And it, it just struck me that that sometimes we have this attitude amongst Federal employees who are supposed to, I, I understand, regulate uh, business, but also probably educate and help them, and yet they get this attitude that somehow the employer is the bad guy. Have you picked up on any of that in your dealings with the Federal Government, whether it be EPA, OSHA, or any other agency? Uh, trucking is actually, I would argue, one of the most heavily regulated uh, enterprises in the United States. Uh, others might have a different opinion. I have been dealing uh, with roughly 15 
different Federal rulemakings just mm -hmm. in the last four months. Uh, it is uh, somewhat overwhelming for a lot of us in the industry to keep up with it. Um, it depends. A lot of times you do, do develop relationships with different yeah. people and agencies, and that that is a very important thing, networking with these folks and developing relationships. But when you don't have a lot of contact with an agency, you are an outsider, yeah. and it is really tough to crack that egg. Yeah. Let me ask you another question. This came out in hearing about uh, a few weeks back in the full committee. We had one of the uh, members of the committee, freshman member, uh, freshman uh, Congressman Ginta from New Hampshire. He asked five business owners. He said, "If you knew, and most of these guys were, uh, started their business 25, 30 years ago, uh, all very successful." He said, "If you knew then what you know now, would you have started relative to regulation? Uh, if you knew back then all the things you have to deal with, I think you mentioned 15 was the number of the different regulators you have to deal with, uh, agencies you have to deal with. If you knew then what you know now, would you have started your business?" And every single one of them said wouldn't have done it, would not have done it. Has that been the experience with some of, some of the folks that you deal with? What I hear from, or their attitude? Yeah, what I hear from our members is they are, they are basically on regulatory overload. I mean, I'm, I, I said 15 yeah. rulemakings in the last four months, and they are major rulemakings that yeah. will change the industry's productivity. Um, people are generally fed up with what they think is an overregulated environment. Mm -hmm. um, it is under, oftentimes under the guise of safety and where that is appropriate, obviously. Yeah. And I didn't get to my question, Mr. Holman, but I will have another round and I will get to that one next time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. I now yield five minutes to Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Kreutzer, I, uh, I read your testimony. I was particularly interested in the um, chart with the high cost of renewable energy systems, where you chart the monthly and annual costs. And, and my, uh, my part in this discussion about regulation has always been that you can assign costs but if you want to get a clear picture, you have to look at cost and benefits simultaneously. Um, uh, otherwise, we are not really understanding the societal impact. And when I, uh, when I look at coal in particular, I don't think that anyone um, could argue that coal, the use of coal and the burning of coal and the after effects on the environment of coal uh, does have adverse environmental impact. Uh, in, in a way, uh, the um, sulfur dioxide byproducts can exacerbate uh, pulmonary problems. It is well recognized. Asthma, emphysema, the, um, uh, the sulfur dioxide, when it travels over many miles, as we, we know this from the Midwest, that coal burning plants in the Midwest uh, end up with the, uh, the, the condensate polluting rivers and lakes in the Northeast. And we have a process of eutrophication there. There's a, you, could, you could actually monetize the costs in terms of adverse health and the uh, adverse impact on the environment. I, I just wanted to uh, share that thought with you because I think it's 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 really important that when we're when we're in a discussion, the essence of which which is what does this cost? And, and your chart, taken within its own context, uh, you, you don't know, you make your argument. But when you when you look at the cost of that technology. There, there is a benefit, uh, there, there is an expense that is offloaded onto the society. I just wanted to, you know, share that with you. Yeah, I, I, I agree. All right. The, and I don't think anybody here is talking about undoing the Clean Air Act back to 1966. The, what I am addressing is carbon dioxide regulation. We already have an uh, extraordinary amount, maybe we need more, I am not here to debate that, regulation for sulfur dioxide and other criterion pollutants. Um, if you want to look at the impact of carbon dioxide on a cost benefit, I think some of the estimates have been exaggerated. But if you take 
the estimates of the social cost of carbon. Add that to the coal cost, that is about two cents per kilowatt hour, it is still much cheaper than wind or solar. All right? It changes the number some, it does not flip any of them around. So, um, well, well, we, we want to no. look at the costs and benefits. What, what benefit in terms of global warming mitigation do you get from this, even with a full-blown waxman market cap and Do you trade? think there is such a thing as global warming? Yeah. Do I think, yeah, the world is warmer. Yeah. So I'm willing I, I, I've just got a few minutes left, and I'm going to have right, to okay. go on. But I thank you. Um, um, the, the, I'd just like to submit for the record, Mr. Chairman, a uh, study that shows in terms of benefits and costs that uh, the proposed rules that we've been pr promoting uh, would avoid um, up to 17,000 premature deaths. 4,500 cases of chronic bronchitis, 1,100 nonfatal heart attacks. These are these are the benefits of of focusing on protecting clean air. So I just like to put this into the record. I, I, in the minute that I have left, I just want to ask uh, Mr. Doniger, uh, can you explain how the tailoring rule works to prevent harm to small businesses? Yes, sir. Thank you. As uh, as I said in my testimony and, and, and in response to Ms. Burkle. The purpose of the tailoring rule is to focus the permit requirement, the requirement that big new plants and big expanded plants examine whether they have the opportunity to control pollution at an affordable and achievable cost. It limits this requirement to very big sources, and it excludes the uh, 95, maybe 97, 99 percent of the so-called 6 million sources that uh, Mr. Kreutzer and others keep saying would be subject to, to Clean Air Act requirements. Uh, it my just time, will not be so. My time has expired, but the Chair has just said that he is going to ask one more question. He has been kind enough to let me ask another question. I have got a follow-up to ask of you, Mr. Doniger, so I go back to the Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that would be great if I could. Um, Mr. Doniger, we, we know that these exemptions are expected to be reconsidered by the EPA in 2013. Uh, do you think the EPA is going to keep this exemption for small s sources of greenhouse gas emissions? Yes, I do. I and, see and no, no you, reason why they would take that exemption away. Well, could you, could you clarify uh, just uh, once more, do, you, do any of the current greenhouse gas permitting regulations burden small sources of greenhouse gas emissions? No, they don't. And, the, and the, the one thing that is in place that actually helps small businesses so far are these standards for vehicles, both light duty and heavy duty, that will save thousands of dollars for small businesses to buy cars and trucks. So bottom line, what is the impact of the current greenhouse gas regulations on small businesses? It is probably helpful to small businesses as a whole. Thank you. Mr. Holman, would you like to maybe pick up where, we, where these guys just left off? Let me, let me start with you by asking this. Uh, you were a former Assistant Chief Counsel of Energy and Environment at the SB Office of Advocacy. Is that right? That is correct. And you authored the comments that SBA submitted to the EPA in 2009 that expressed concern about the EPA's endangerment finding and greenhouse gas tailoring rules. Is that right? Yes, the comments in 2008 and 2009. Both 8 and 9. Good. Now, uh, so in your, in, in your former capacity, can you give us some insight into the discussion that just took place and the impact that, that this stuff will have on small business? Well, I can it seems to me you are pretty darn uniquely positioned to comment on, on the, the, the conversation we just heard. Well, I guess I appreciate that comment. Uh, you know, there was a lot of discussion between the Office of Advocacy and EPA on the tailoring rule, and there is no doubt that the tailoring rule is a help to many small businesses because it does delay the permitting requirements that would otherwise be falling on small businesses the way it has fallen on the lime industry even now. And I can first address what are those, what are those impacts that are falling on us and on some other smalls and that ultimately will fall on all small businesses potentially. And that is uncertainty because of GHG permitting. So imagine that you are required to uh, comply with GHG permitting and you want to do some sort of modernization or expansion of your plant. What it is going to mean is that you have to go to get a permit to, to do that expansion. And in that process of getting that permit, it could be that every aspect of your operations will wind up being looked at by 
EPA or a State under what is known as Best Available Control Technology Review. The concern by most of the industrial sources and even some of the small ones is that that process could wind up requiring you to install non-related things, things that have nothing to do with emissions but have to do with energy efficiency or some other improvement in your plant that would be very expensive. And it has a chilling effect, because imagine you go to a bank and you say, I want to get financing for a project that I am going to do at my facility. Well, when do you have to put it in? I don't know. What is it going to be? I am not sure, because EPA can't really tell me what it is. We will only know at the end of the process. And even then, we might not know, because that is subject to being challenged in court and potentially mm -hmm. being changed. So there is a lot of uncertainty just in terms of this process is not cut and dried. Unlike the BACT process that has existed for criteria pollutants for 35 years, we are in a totally new arena here when it comes to greenhouse gases. Nobody knows exactly what is going to be required. So when you say, you know, what is the magnitude of this impact on smalls, the moment we don't really know, it is very open-ended, and that has uncertainty, which, as you know, business people hate. Mm -hmm. um, from the standpoint of the Office of Advocacy, we wanted a tailoring rule or something that would at least temporarily soften the blow, which tailoring rule does that, but not for everybody, certainly not for the lime industry, bricks, small utilities, you know, municipal utilities, rural electric cooperatives, foundries. There are a number of businesses that are not going to be entirely shielded by the tailoring well, the, rule. And, and so when you put this together and you gave your comments and recommendations to the EPA, and yet you, you just talk about entities who are, you think, impacted in a negative way. Did, did you think EPA followed your comments? Did they follow the statutory requirements they were supposed to follow? Did they listen? I mean, talk about that process. Speaking from my own perspective as an individual, my sense was that EPA was, was in a rush to get this rule completed. We wanted very much to have, as I mentioned in my testimony, we wanted EPA to stop or to slow down, consider what the impacts were going to be on smalls, and try to come up with a way to design the rule so that it would protect them. EPA was not really interested in alternatives, was not really interested in listening to what the smalls had to say. Other but this one I want to be clear on. And, but the, the, my understanding, the law requires them to give serious consideration uh, due diligence to your recommendations. Is that accurate? That is correct. And do you think that took place? That is the question. We were not satisfied that that took place, which is why we wrote four public letters to EPA saying you must do a panel before you proceed with these rulemakings. So in your role as advocate for small business uh, in front of the EPA, they did not follow, in your mind, what the, what the law requires them to follow? It was our belief that EPA did not follow the Regulatory Flexibility Act. They certified the rule and went with what they considered to be a compromise under Section 609C of the Regulatory Flexibility Had Act. Had that ever been done before? That no, it has never correct. been done before. So didn't follow normal practice, took an action never done before on an issue that you told them was going to impact small business owners in a negative way. Is that we, accurate? We told them at least four times. In four public, times you told them? In public documents. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Holman. I appreciate that. We got one, one more round from Ms. Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Kreutzer, uh, you had started to answer a question about uh, global warming, and I have a feeling you didn't finish your answer. And I wondered if you could just um, Good job. expand on that. I, I think I was responding to uh, Congressman Kucinich um, asking me if I believed in global warming. And you know, I said, yeah, we are warming. The, the, the question, though, is more than are we having warming and is it caused by human-made emissions? We are looking at a set of regulations, and if we are going to do cost and benefit, we need to look at what is the cost of the regulation compared to how much benefit you get from reduced global warming. That is the problem with CO2, if there is one. And climatologists looked at the Waxman-Markey bill, which was more comprehensive than the current EPA regulations. Their estimates were that by 2050, if you use the, the largest sensitivity of temperature to CO2, the high end, there were the maximum change moderation from Waxman-Markey, that is, how much difference would Waxman-Markey make, thousands of a degree in 2050, maybe a few tenths of a degree in 2100. This will have less impact than that. So we, need, we, don't, we can't compare the costs here 
to stopping tsunamis. We have to compare the cost here to what actually in, what impact it will have on moderating world temperatures. And it is pretty minimal in 50 years, not even measurable. Thank you. In your testimony, you talk about the cost, the, cap and, the cost of cap yes. and trade and uh, the cost to our GDP as well as the number of employees. Um, can you comment in general, that is specific to that p piece of legislation, but what regulations are doing? We are, our country has had 20 plus months of unemployment hovering at 9 to 10 percent. So we are concerned about that. We want to get government out of the way so businesses can succeed. Can you shed some yeah, light we, on we that? Ha we haven't done an estimate on the impact of the most recent regulations. We are working on ones for the projected uh, EPA regulations. But one of the things that happens when you have an environment where you say we might impose this, we might impose this, it makes it very difficult to make investment. Now, some on the other side would say that is why we need to have the regulations. But that is when you say we know for certain it is going to be really bad. When, you, when, you, when, you, when there is some uncertainty that is really bad, you still don't want to invest. But when it comes through horrible, uh, you know, that, that's even worse. Okay, so yeah, we, we have a problem um, where to, to make the investments in power industry, the, you know, to, to build the power plants we're going to need uh, for firms that are in, in energy intensive industries or reluctant to go forward um, if they think the regulations are going to be burdensome. And I just want to go back to your previous answer to the first question I asked you. Um, is there, in your opinion, what is the connection between the CO2 emission and global warming? The, I am not a scientist, I am an economist, so I will, it's close to a man on the street interview now. The, um, the, 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 there will be some warming from man made emissions, probably. There are some models that show some offsetting. But the, the CO2 by itself, if it doubles, will lead to a doubling, excuse me, will lead to a degree and a half of warming. The argument is all about, are there feedback loops? The models have lots of them. The data so far, we look at the last 15 years, we don't have accelerating warming. You know, it's kind of hit the, the 1999 level. It's been pretty flat. So um, you know, we, we, we don't know for sure what it is. But more importantly, let's say it is the 4.5 degrees C that they're talking about at the high end of the IPCC model. What does any of this regulation do? If all it does is impose costs and make us feel like we are doing something but we are not, then we are getting the, the, the warming anyway and unemployment and lower income. So whether you believe IPCC or not, this is not a solution. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. The gentlewoman from California, do you wish to ask this panel some questions? You are welcome to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, maybe, maybe California really is on another planet, but um, we did pass AB 32. There was an effort uh, to repeal that. It failed miserably. And Californians recognize that we all have a responsibility to be stewards of this planet. Now, having said that, small business in California has spoken up very strongly in favor of AB 32, which would limit greenhouse gases. And, Mr. Chairman, for uh, the record, I would like to submit a letter and document uh, from the small business majority that uh, basically says the following. Our research has continually shown that the Clean Air Act is good for small business. A report we released in October of last year found that the benefits of the law have far outweighed the costs. The Office of Management and Budget predicts that the total economic benefits of the Clean Air Act to be more than four to eight times the cost of compliance. Our report also found that the law has spurred important technological innovations such as the catalytic converter, and exports of these and other environmental technologies were valued at $30 billion in 2004. These are encouraging numbers and cannot be ignored. Furthermore, um, and without Got objection, objection, furthermore, um, you know, I am amused because when the Clean Air Act in 1990 was being considered, Ford Motor Company claimed that, quote, we just do not have the technology to comply. And yet, look where we are today. Ford Motor Company, Chevrolet, every one of the auto manufacturers are embracing um, all of the, the clean air standards and creating electric cars and hybrid cars, and the public is embracing them as well. So I guess my question to you is, Mr. Doniger, um, is 
there some level of exaggeration going on here? Thank you, Congresswoman. It seems as though wherever we are in time, the regulations of the past are embraced and the regulations of the future are treated like Armageddon. And then we move on a little bit more in time and those regulations become embraced because, as, you, as your examples show, the benefits are proven, the economic costs turn out to be much smaller than were uh, forecasted by lobbyists up here, and uh, life goes on. The economy uh, of the United States has tripled in size since 1970, while we have been able to cut the, the emissions of most pollutants by 60 percent or more. So we can do these two things at once. And uh, I would just call your attention to a study by uh, three economists. Roger Bezdek is the first name. I would be happy to supply this uh, for the record. And if I may recite just one paragraph of his findings. Conven contrary to conventional wisdom, environmental protection, economic growth and jobs creation are complementary and compatible. Investments in environmental protection create jobs and displace jobs, but the net effect on employment is positive. Second, environmental protection has grown rapidly to become a major sales generating, job creating industry. $300 billion a year and 5 million jobs in 2003. Most of the 5 million jobs created are standard jobs for accountants, engineers, computer analysts, clerks, factory workers, etc., and the classic environmental job, environmental engineer, ecologist, etc., constitutes only a small portion of the jobs created. Most of the persons employed in the jobs created may not even realize that they owe their livelihood to environmental to protecting the environment. So uh, this is a big business and it is a big contribution to our economy and uh, where our economy grows because we protect our environment. Thank you, Mr. Doniger. Uh, one final question, and this has probably been addressed already earlier in the hearing, but this is supposed to be focusing in on small business and the impacts on small business. Um, the EPA tailoring rule, which has come forward, would suggest that you have to spew out 75,000 tons a year to be subject to any kind of regulation by EPA. Are mo most small businesses spewing out 75,000 tons? No, they are not. Most of, uh, uh, virtually all of the, the buildings, the small businesses that own those buildings are untouched by this regulation. Now, several of the people here have suggested, well, that may not, re that may not be true in the future. Well, if Congress was going to do something that would be uh, uh, constructive and help create the uh, regulatory certainty we need, it would be to lock in the tailoring rule the way it is now and take away any uncertainty about how it develops in the future. And that uncertainty exists only because there is a limit on how long EPA is allowed to make an exemption under the court doctrines that EPA is using to justify these exemptions. And uh, Congress, of course, can make those exemptions permanent. If you lock in the tailoring rule, we will have the certainty, the focus on the big pollution sources, get the technology on them, and leave the small fries alone. Thank you. My time is expired. Well, I think, the Mr. Donner, just let me follow up then real quick. But which is it? Earlier you said that more regulation has been good, it has added to the economy, it has been growth, and now you are saying they should lock in the tailoring rule to take away any uncertainty and not expand it. So, I mean, which way is it? Well, the way it is, Congressman. But I mean, your, your premise to well, the, so the first question of hers was more regulation is good. Not all more regulation, sir. Oh, so it is isn't all. Some, so some regulation could be bad. Of course. Okay, but that is not what you said. You said regulation was good, it added to the economy, I it was said wonderful. The, the regulation that we, the greenhouse gas safeguards that EPA is putting in place are net plus. I think plus. you said regulations in the past have been embraced as the good stuff, but all the future when everyone always says they are bad, and that, you said that is not the case, it is good. So you made this general statement that regulation was good for business, good for the economy, and now you are saying, no, we should limit the tailoring rule, it shouldn't expand it, we have got to take away any uncertainty out there. I just want to know which way is it. I am sure we can work out which are the positive economic growth promoting, health promoting regulations and which are not helpful. I am here to, to present the case that what is being done now makes perfect common sense and what EPA has done is to, to make sure that the small businesses are not burdened 
by the kinds of regulations that don't make sense. Any further questions for the first panel? I want to thank you all for uh, joining us today. We do need to move along. And I apologize for the schedule. It is, uh, as I said earlier, just one of those weeks around Congress. Uh, we will get ready for our second panel. We will move through that as quickly as we possibly can. Thank you all. Welcome. As soon as we get you situated, we will get we'll started here. Okay, we are pleased to welcome our second panel of witnesses. We have the Honorable Gina McCarthy, who is the Assistant Administrator at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Welcome, Ms. McCarthy. And we also have Ms. Claudia Rogers, who is the Deputy Chief Counsel at the Small Business Administration's Office of Advocacy. We have, as if you were here for the uh, uh, first um, panel, we have a practice here. Please uh, rise and raise your right hands. You solemnly swear to uh, or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Let the record show both witnesses answered in the affirmative. And let's go right to, uh, uh, we will go right down the list of the row here. Ms. Uh, Rogers, you are up first. Go right ahead. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of the subcommittee, my name is Claudia Rogers and I am Deputy Chief Counsel for the Office of Advocacy at the U.S. Small Business Administration. I am pleased to have the opportunity to appear before this committee on behalf of Chief Counsel Dr. Winslow Sargent. In the interest of time, I will summarize my prepared testimony and ask that my full statement be included in the record. Because advocacy is an independent body within SBA, my testimony does not necessarily reflect the position of the administration or the SBA. Congress established the Office of Advocacy to represent the views of small entities before Federal agencies in Congress. The Office of Advocacy is charged with oversight of agency compliance with the Regulatory Flexibility Act. The RFA, as amended by the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act, gives small entities a voice in the Federal rulemaking process. For all rules that are expected to have a significant economic impact on a substantial number of small entities, EPA must conduct SBRIFA panels to assess the impact of, of the proposed rule on small entities and to consider less burdensome alternatives. Advocacy and EPA have a long and productive working relationship. Since SBRIFA was signed into law in 1996, EPA has conducted nearly 40 SBRIFA panels to assess the impact of proposed rules on small entities and to consider less burdensome alternatives. These panels allow for small business to give direct feedback on the potential cost of the proposed rules and to suggest and develop less burdensome alternatives. Final panel reports must be signed by the Chief Counsel for Advocacy, the Administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, and the Administrator of the EPA. In 15 years of SBRIFA panels, advocacy has found that the panel process is a useful way for small businesses to provide valuable input into the rulemaking process. In short, the panel process works. SBRIFA panels have saved billions of dollars for small businesses due to changes and improvements that were made to propose rules while still allowing EPA to achieve their statutory objective. While advocacy does occasionally have disagreements with EPA on procedure and policy, we are also very proud of the work we have done with EPA to improve regulations and reduce the burdens on small businesses. We currently have five SBRIFA panels underway on EPA rules, and we will continue to work with EPA in a constructive way to make sure the RFA and SBRIFA are being followed and the impacts of regulations on small businesses are being taken into account. With respect to regulation of greenhouse gases, advocacy disagrees with EPA on whether the impacts on small businesses were properly considered. 
Advocacy has been clear and consistent in its public comment letters and other communications with EPA about our positions on these issues. We believe EPA should have held Sabrifa panels and conducted thorough RFA analysis to explore potential impacts of greenhouse gas regulations on small entities. In four years of greenhouse gas regulatory activity, EPA has not evaluated the economic effects that its initial endangerment finding and mobile source emission standards have had on small businesses. Advocacy does not challenge EPA's authority to implement the Clean Air Act. However, we do believe a more thorough analysis was needed, including Sabrifa panels, to fully consider the impacts greenhouse gas regulation would have on small businesses. These concerns were noted in Advocacy's four public comment letters attached to my testimony. In 2008, when EPA issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking indicating it might regulate greenhouse gases, Advocacy filed public comments asking EPA to hold Sabrifa panels on any greenhouse gas regulation to ensure the effects of small entities could be considered. When EPA issued its endangerment finding in 2009, Advocacy again filed public comments advising EPA to conduct Sabrifa panels to explore potential impacts of greenhouse gas regulation on small entities. In EPA's subsequent proposed regulation of motor vehicle greenhouse gas emission standards and the proposed tailoring rule, EPA again certified under the RFA that such standards would have no significant impact on a substantial number of small entities. EPA did acknowledge some of the potential burdens on small businesses and established a phase-in compliance program with the tailoring rule. This action led to significant cost savings for small businesses, and EPA deserves credit for its implementation. However, advocacy believes EPA should have done a Sabrifa panel, which would have better reflected the views of small businesses and improved the rule. In conclusion, while EPA has expressed its desire to reach out to small entities and has provided temporary relief to small businesses, advocacy remains concerned that EPA has not fully complied with both the spirit and the requirements of the RFA on the greenhouse gas rules. EPA did conduct public outreach. However, public outreach is not a substitute for the concrete feedback agencies get from small businesses during the panel process. We look forward to continuing to work with EPA on these and other important regulations. Thank you for the opportunity to address such an important issue for small business. I appreciate your work in the interest of advocacy, in the Office of Advocacy, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Rogers. Ms. McCarthy. Uh, Chairman uh, Jordan, Ranking Member Kucinich. And members of the subcommittee, I want to thank you for inviting me here today, and I am honored to be sitting here with Ms. Rogers. Um, I hear repeatedly from members that small business constituents are very concerned about EPA updating its Clean Air Act programs to address greenhouse gases. But when I listen to the concerns, I am most struck by the fact that what they think we are doing bears little or no relationship to what we are actually doing. I appreciate today's opportunity to try to set that record straight. The agency is taking a common-sense approach to meet our Clean Air Act obligations to reduce carbon pollution. Our focus now is not on small sources at all, but on the largest polluters. Perhaps the most repeated misinformation about greenhouse gas regulation in small businesses relates to greenhouse gas air permits. Contrary to the most commonly heard claims, small sources are not currently covered by the permitting program. EPA adopted regulations last year that exempt small sources for at least the next five years, and we cannot include them absent a future rulemaking with public comment that would do so. I know some of your constituents are concerned about what has been called the cow tax. Well, let me reassure you that the agency has no intention or desire to impose taxes on cows, pigs, chickens, or any other livestock. And while we routinely hear concerns that our greenhouse gas standards will cause incredible increases in gas prices and electricity rates, none of these estimates are actually based on the analysis of our programs. Instead, they are based on studies, and many of them are severely flawed, of economy-wide cap-and-trade programs that bear absolutely no relationship to EPA's actions. In sharp contrast to these concerns, the only greenhouse gas standard EPA has issued under its existing Clean Air Act authority will save small businesses money. 
the average American, pur American purchasing a new passenger vehicle that meets our greenhouse gas standards would net savings of $3,000. Our proposed standards for medium and heavy-duty vehicles would, would net operators of semi-trucks savings of up to $74,000 over the truck's use for life. Misconceptions about the effects of EPA programs are unfortunately no surprise. Over the last 40 years, similar unsupported claims have been made nearly every time EPA has taken significant steps to protect the American public. In the 70s, we were told that by using the Clean Air Act to phase in catalytic converters for new cars and trucks, that entire industries might collapse. Instead, the requirement gave birth to a global market for catalytic converters and enthroned American manufacturers at the pinnacle of that market. In the 80s, people claimed that the proposed Clean Air Act amendments would cause a quiet death for businesses across the country. But instead, the U.S. economy actually grew by 64 percent, even as the implementation of Clean Air Act amendments cut acid rain pollution in half. In the 90s, when we took, out, took steps to phase out chemicals that deplete the ozone layer, a refrigeration industry representative testified that we will see shutdowns of refrigeration equipment in supermarkets, in air conditioners, in large office buildings, hotels and hospitals. None of that happened. Instead, the phase-out happened five years faster and cost 30 percent less. EPA is using the same Clean Air Act tools that we have been using for these past 40 years to protect public health to now address the public health threat that is posed by carbon pollution. These Clean Air Act tools have proven their worth over and over in these years to improve public health. In fact, Clean Air Act programs adopted since 1990 are expected to, prov to provide $2 trillion in benefits in 2020 alone, over $30 in benefits for every dollar spent. Just last year, these programs are estimated to have reduced premature mortality, equivalent to saving over 160,000 lives and to have enhanced productivity by preventing 13 million lost workdays. I will close with a statement by the Small Business Majority and the Main Street Alliance. Any step to delay or limit EPA's ability to regulate greenhouse gases and other pollution has negative implications for many businesses, whether they are large or small. It would hamper the growth of the clean energy sector of the economy, a sector that a majority of small business owners view as essential to their ability to, complete, to compete. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you both uh, for your testimony and your time here. I am going to let the ranking member go because he has to run to a, another meeting, and then we will finish up. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. McCarthy, in a hearing about the impacts of greenhouse gas regulations, I think it is important to discuss the reason why these regulations exist. In his written testimony, Mr. Doniger cited the National Academy of Sciences, which concluded, and I quote, climate change is occurring, is caused largely by human activities and poses significant risks for, and in many cases already affecting, a broad range of human and natural systems, unquote. The National Academy of Sciences continued to explain that the scientific basis for reaching this conclusion has, and I quote, been so thoroughly examined and tested and supported by so many independent observations and result that their likelihood of subsequently being found to be wrong is vanishingly small. Such conclusions and theories are then regarded as settled facts, unquote. Now, Ms. McCarthy, as you know, the National Academy of Sciences is far from the only organization that has reached legitimate, compelling scientific conclusions that illustrate the real danger caused by climate change. Entities, including the World Health Organization, the International Monetary Fund, and the U.S. Global Change Research Program, a program mandated by Congress to integrate climate change, federal research, all definitively identified climate change as a real danger. Now, Ms. McCarthy, do you agree that the science that provides the impetus for greenhouse gas regulation is indisputable? And if you do, why? I do, Mr. Kucinich, and, th and that is because the best available peer-reviewed science that we have found indicates that greenhouse gas emissions threaten the health and welfare of the American people. That is what the Administrator said in making her endangerment finding. It is backed not just by EPA research, but by the full breadth of all of the agencies in the Federal Government who address these types of issues, including the National Academy of Sciences, including NASA, including NOAA. 
all of, this, all of the agencies that we rely on to provide the best science to this country and internationally have told us that the simple fact is that, that greenhouse gases are endangering public health and the environment, and it is time to take action now to reduce those pollutants. Well, did the EPA allow for comments from private industry, including small businesses, on a greenhouse gas endangerment finding? We did. It went through a rulemaking process. It was one of the most thorough of the agencies. We had more than 350,000 comments, which we addressed individually. We had 11 volumes of response to comment on, on this rule. Um, we believe we did the most thorough job um, that the agency could and that the, the, and that the science is indisputable. So what do, what do you say, then, to the small businesses who are continuing to express concern that EPA is not paying attention to, to them and the EPA is endangering their businesses? What do you say to them? Um, I, I would tell uh, them that the EPA understands that our obligation under the Clean Air Act is to regulate greenhouse gases and that they pose a substantial public health uh, problem. I would tell them that we are taking reasonable, common sense steps to address greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act in the way that Congress intended in a way that protects the interest of the small businesses, in a way that will continue to allow the economy to grow, to continue to allow jobs to happen. We are doing the same thing to regulate greenhouse gases as we have successfully done with other pollutants under the Clean Air Act, and we will look at the economic impacts. We have done that. We will continue to do that. We will act deliberately and smart and use a common sense approach. You heard the testimony of the witnesses in a previous panel, did you not? I did. You know, I think we have to be concerned about small business communicating their difficulties. And uh, I know Mr. Doniger's testimony is that uh, most of the small businesses, uh, that the rules would not necessarily apply to them. But I think for those to whom they do apply, uh, they are looking for some words from you that would indicate that uh, you, you're trying to do everything you can to make sure people can stay in business at the same time trying to protect the environment. Is that a fair characterization? That is correct. Okay. I want to thank the Chairman for uh, indulging uh, me with this opportunity to go first. Thank you. Yield back. Yield back. I, I, I appreciate it, gentlemen. Um, thank you. Uh, Ms. Rogers, the, the uh, Sabrifa Act has been around for about 15 years. Is that, that right? Since 1980, 30 years. 30 years. Okay. And um, how many SBAR panels? I'm sorry, the RFA is 30 years. The brief has been 1996. 1996, about 15 years. That's what I had. Um, the and how many uh, SBAR panels have, have, have you been involved with 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 the EPA at that time frame? The Office of Advocacy has been involved with nearly 40. I think we're up to about 38 now. And you have some. I think in your testimony, isn't it true? You said you had like five underway right right yes, now. Yes, five currently. Okay, and 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 you believe these have been positive. Yes, overall, actually, EPA is one of the better actors in terms of compliance with the RFA in general. Um, when we were developing a training program uh, in, back in 2002, we had to go to agencies to find out those who do it best to help us develop the program, and we went to EPA. So you got a, you got a good relationship, a good, good track record with EPA in, in yes. all these except the one that is at issue today. Is that right? Yes, we are concerned about the greenhouse gas regulation. So the, the normal process was not done with the greenhouse gas issue and, and its effect on small business. All the other times it has been fine when you recommend it, when you went through it, except for this one particular one. We felt that the Office of Advocacy, yes, felt that taken as a whole or separately, the greenhouse gas regulations clearly had a significant economic impact on a substantial number of small entities, and therefore a Sabrifa panel should have been held. And, and is this a notable exception or is this the only exception to when you suggested you move in this, this way and, and go through the, the process that the law spells out? Is this a notable exception? So is this one of the few that has been done this way or is this the only one that has been done this way? It is one of a few. However, certainly over the years, over 15 years and 40 panels, we are bound to have disagreements over their certifications on some rules, but it is really one of, one of the very few. Okay, so when Ms. McCarthy answered the ranking members' questions about there was a process that was that was undertaking, uh, undertaken with small business owners, it wasn't the normal process. Correct. Okay, and Ms. McCarthy, why? Uh, I, uh, Mr. Jordan, I would just disagree with the characterization that it wasn't a normal process. I, I would emphasize that EPA certainly follows both the letter and the spirit of the RFA as it has been amended by well, Sabrifa. But, but, but she, it, just hang on one second. Let, Ms. Rogers just, just testified that it has been a great relationship. You have worked things out. 
It process has been followed almost mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And yet here we have a pretty important rule. We do. Clean Air Act, greenhouse gas, pretty important stuff that they feel is going to have a real impact on small business. It would seem to me you would want to follow the standard procedure and go through what has been the custom and the practice. So why not in this situation? We did follow the appropriate procedure. What we, I think where we disagree is that the tailoring rule, which seems to be the issue at hand, uh, is a burden reduction rule. We, we no, but I, no, but here's, here, this is important. You keep saying you followed the normal procedure, but Ms. Rogers says it, out of the ordinary. The gentleman before, I assume you saw where Mr. Holman talked and said out of the ordinary, uh, not the normal process. So there are, there are a variety of ways to comply with the law. EPA generally goes above and beyond, and we always meet both the letter and the spirit of the law. In this instance, we made a decision that we did not need to convene a panel because the tailoring rule was a deregulation rule. In fact, it reduced the burden for 6 million small businesses to have to deal with greenhouse gas permitting. And in that instance, we did not convene a panel. Now, we did get comment from SPA indicating that they thought we should. I believe the disagreement is one that we have had in the past before. In particular, you believe SPA, or do you know? Oh, I do know, yes. Okay. Let, me, let me explain when that happened. And that had to do with the ozone and fine particle standards that we issued in 1997. Mm -hmm. At that point in time, SBA also indicated to us that we should convene a panel. We indicated that that, that rule was not subject to a, a panel requirement that was actually taken to court. The D.C. Circuit said that SBA's interpretation of the RFA doesn't carry it any more weight than EPA's, and they disagreed with S SBA and found that our interpretation of the RFS was persuasive. We actually won that case, and we have never, ever okay. lost a case. Ms. Ms. Rogers, case. did you suggest a, a panel be convened for uh, the tailoring rule and the endangerment finding and the light duty truck rule? Yes, we did. And we do have, yes, we did, Congressman. We do so have, all three. And Ms. McCarthy, you, you declined to do it for each of those? Well, we explained each of those rules, and, and I can go through them if you would like, but we still believe we took the appropriate action. Because you talked about the tailoring the rule. I didn't, I didn't hear you talk about the other two. But, I, so I three times. I can talk about the endangerment finding. Endangerment finding, okay. The, we, EPA looks at costs and looks at getting some brief well, But let's, let's cut to the chase here. An, Why not on something this important, something you know, of, of this magnitude? Why not do the standard practice? Why, why go through this? Why, why just to, and, and, you know, to cite this, this decision, that, and here is why? And why not just do what the advocacy group that is in the law and follow the process that is de designed to be followed? We did follow the process that is designed to be followed. Um, what I would, would indicate to you is that Well, is again, I, I, we got the advocates for small business, both of them saying you didn't. I would, I would disagree, so respectfully. Okay. We will yield to the um, to the uh, ranking member, or ranking member, to the, to the chair of the full committee, the gentleman from California. Excuse me. I, I was I was ranking. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm oh no, you I should take Ms. Spear. I apologize, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to insult you twice in, in, in 30 seconds. Well, uh, ladies we, first, please. Well, and, and I didn't see, I didn't see, I didn't see the gentlelady walk in from California. So California is going to get covered nonetheless here, one way or the other. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would have yielded, but I have um, constituents who are waiting in the wings to talk with me, so I would like to take my opportunity now. Uh, Ms. Rogers, Chairman Issa circulated a Dear Colleague letter to House members yesterday, I believe, that cites a September 2010 report issued by the SBA Office of Advocacy authored by Crane and Crane. The report estimated that the annual cost of regulation was more than $1.75 trillion. That is kind of a staggering figure. Um, and yet, in February of this year, Professors Sid Shapiro and Ruth Ruttenberg released a critique of the Crane and Crane study calling setting the record straight. And the Shapiro Ruttenberg report found that the Crane and Crane report had severe flaws, quote unquote. One of these flaws in the study was that they looked at costs of regulation without looking at the benefits. I think you can make the case, if you look at the cost of running Congress, it is staggering. But some would argue that there is some benefit associated with running Congress. In any case, 
Um, Ms. Rogers, unless you all want to retire or resign <laughs> at this point in time, Ms. Rogers, did the SBA Office of Advocacy contract with Nicole Crane and Mark Crane, and did they ask the authors to evaluate the benefits of regulation or only the costs? Thank you, Congresswoman. We did not ask them to evaluate the benefits as well, and the reason is this. The, this is the fourth in a series of studies we have done on the same issue, which is the cost of regulations on the impact of those regulations on small businesses. The purpose of the study is not to show regulations are bad and not to show that regulations are, uh, all of them are overburdensome for small business. The purpose was to show that small businesses feel the effect of regulations differently than large businesses. And the way that the reason that was done for the cost, not the benefits, because the costs are what affects small businesses most, and it is what the Regulatory, Fel Re Regulatory Flexibility Act requires our office to oversee, which asks agencies to review the cost of their regulations. All right. How much did that study cost? Oh, I'm, I don't know that answer. Would you please to provide you. that to I'd the be committee? Happy to, yes. uh, another flaw in the study, uh, in the, identified by Shapiro and Ruttenberg, was that the SBA's Office of Advocacy never had access to the underlying data used in the report. A little astonishing to me. If you can't look at the underlying data, then you know, garbage in, garbage out is the way I look at things. Uh, Ms. Rogers, does your office have the data used in the Crane and Crane study? If so, will you please make that data available to us? I will check and see if our office has the data would make available to you. I do know that it is, it, I'm, I'm told that it is available through Crane and Crane on their website or through their website that they have made it available. It, when we contract out studies, our office is not required to ask for that data and make it publicly available. Well, the, let me the suggest usually. Let me suggest to you that from a public perspective, if you are using taxpayer funds, we deserve to have the underlying data so we can, in fact, determine whether or not it is accurate. Uh, Ms. McCarthy, if EPA funded a study, would the agency expect to have access to the underlying data? Uh, the agency would not only have access to it, the public would. All right. I think that makes sense. Um, in addition, Shapiro and Ruttenberg, one of the peer reviewers, Richard Williams from the Merc Mercatus Center, raised concerns that the report's regulatory quality index may not measure what the authors say it measures, and even if it does, it may overstate the cost of regulation when used in conjunction with other measures. Uh, Ms. Rogers, what, if anything, was done to address this concern that was raised during the peer review process? We did have the, the uh, document, the study peer reviewed, and it came back with um, actually excellent reviews during the peer review process. This is, as I mentioned, it is one in, in four studies. Crane has been involved, the author has been involved in many of our studies previously, which have not had and used the exact same methodology, have not had complaints before then. Uh, we have done it in 1995, 2001, 2005, and 2010. So it is basically the same methodology, a new version of the same study with an updated cost on how they are, these costs are affecting small businesses. Ms. McCarthy, do you have any concerns with the peer review process used to evaluate the Crane and Crane study? Uh, I do, and, and I am glad you asked that. Uh, as far as I know, the study was reviewed by two individuals. Uh, the sum total of one of the individual's comments was, and I quote, I looked it over and it is terrific, nothing to add, congrats. Um, if this is the quality of the peer review of that study, then I would suggest to you it is a study that EPA could certainly not put its weight behind. EPA is required to do peer review analysis of its studies. It is required to have our studies have analytic consistency, rigor, real peer review, transparency. The last report that EPA went out and, and, and contracted for and worked through was peer reviewed by 34 economists and technical individuals. We had a thorough public comment process. What I have here holding is a double-sided copy of just their last comments that they submitted to us during the peer review process. Two individuals does not make a substantive peer review process when we have repeatedly asked for the underlying data and have not been provided it by Crane and Crane or by the SBA. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I know my time has expired, but I would just like to suggest to all of us that taxpayer funds should be spent on studies that really give us good data. And certainly the data should be available to us and to the taxpayers of this country. So I would hope that as we look at ways of making sure that government operates effectively, that we require that moving forward. Thank you. I think the lady, she makes a good suggestion. Let, let me just following up on that. Ms. McCarthy, in, your, in the closing of your testimony, you say, I will close with a statement by the small business majority, uh, and you quote, the ability to regulate greenhouse gases should not be limited. 
do, do you know uh, how many members, uh, what the membership is in the small business majority? Do you know that number? I am sorry, I do not. Well, according to the New York Times story, July 8, 2009, small business majority has no membership. Its founder, Mr. John Ahrensmeyer, says it can no longer objectively represent small business if it had membership. So the, while the general lady from California's point is good, the close of your testimony cites a group, at least according to the New York Times, that has no membership and yet portrays itself as an organization representing small business. So I, I think both points are well taken, and you should make sure in your testimony you are quoting from a source that actually might, might reflect something uh, of the interest of, of small business. And with that, I would yield to the uh, Chairman of the full committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I am sorry that the, uh, uh, my colleague from uh, California left. Let me just make something clear for the record. Uh, Ms. Rogers, uh, Ms. McCarthy, you are both working for departments headed by President Obama political appointees, right? Yes. So when she sort of implies that one side of the, your two positions is, must be good and the other is ill-conceived and doesn't care about the same things uh, that we, uh, we all saw President Obama elected for, uh, at least, Ms. Rogers, I suspect you object to some idea that, that you don't care to get it right or that somehow your mandate is different in some way. Wouldn't that be true? Yes, Congressman, I would absolutely object. And small businesses care about clean air and care about um, the environment. So we, we want to make that point as well. Well, let me ask you both a question. Uh, isn't it true you could both be right that Ms. McCarthy, with a mandate to essentially have the cleanest possible air and water, can, in fact, in good conscience, make every effort to be as pure as possible. We used to say driven snow, but I have seen what it looks like when it melts, so I won't, I won't go there. And isn't it possible, Ms. Rogers, that you, when you go out and you get a study that shows $1.75 trillion, that you are not saying that you can save all of it and still have the level of clean air and clean water the American people expect? Wouldn't they, couldn't you both be right? I would absolutely agree. Now, Ms. McCarthy, wouldn't you agree that somewhere in $1.75 trillion, if that is an accurate number, that some of that should be reviewed and reconsidered to see if, in fact, changes could save much of that burden and free up those dollars for other uses, even if they are uses to help clean the environment, that not every regulation has accomplished what you wanted it to in a sound science way? Wouldn't you agree? We are in the process now of complying with the President's executive order and doing a review of our regulations. Yeah, but I actually was looking at the conclusion. Wouldn't you conclude that there has got to be something there that you could, you could relook at that would help get burden off the backs of small business and maybe even not small business that, in fact, on a tradeoff of cost-benefit is not the best regulation out there? Mr. Isa, I would suggest to you that we continually look at those issues, and we are working with the small okay, business. Okay. Well, then maybe you could explain something speak. to me. In Boiler Mact, yes. you have got a standard that can't be adhered to, and you have gone to the courts asking them to give you relief, and they have said, we can't relieve you from your stupidity. Go to Congress. Now, isn't that a, a, a slightly vulgar, but pretty much the exact truth, that you have got something that does not exist? You have created a rule that cannot presently be done. You have gone to the courts trying to get temporary relief in hopes that someday it will be able to be complied with, rather than saying, what is it that exists that can be complied with? Wouldn't that be a fair characterization? I don't believe so, no. Okay. What part of it was inaccurate? Tell me in specificity. The, the specific issue is the Boiler Act rule went through a public process. No. I am looking at the outcome. Uh, the, is, the, uh, is the science attainable today, according yes, to your It yes, is. Then why yes. did you ask the Court for relief? Because we believe that it deserved reconsideration because some of the legal underpinnings during the public comment process, because of comments we heard from industry, many of them small businesses, we made substantial changes from proposal to final, which warranted additional legal underpinnings through a public comment process. So why we will you just, do that. Why wouldn't you just pull the rule? Uh, there was no need to do that, and we were under a court order to deliver a final rule within a given point in time, which we did. So but now we, we have something for which you have asked the court for relief and they can't give you relief? No. What we, will, what we intend to do is reconsider the rule in due time. We will respond appropriately. It will be legally sound, and it is already scientifically credible. 
but not currently available. Oh, it is actually a final rule. No, no, I am talking about the actual technology. Oh, no, I am sorry. I believe that the, the requirements in the rule are, are achievable. Well, thank you. I appreciate your having that opinion under oath. Uh, the, uh, the mandate for these impacts, uh, you've, last year, and we have probably been brought up, but I will just bring it up again. Last year, I sent the Administrator, Administrator Jackson a letter requesting the EPA suspend finalization of its uh, greenhouse gas proposals until uh, after the agency complied with the Office of Advocacy uh, demand. You sent me back a response on February 4, informing me that the agency's decision was to move forward at that time. You indicated that your outreach under uh, 609C fully satisfied EPA's obligation uh, to assess the impact and actions on small business. Do you still stand behind that? Yes. Ms. Jackson, Ms. Rogers, do you think that, uh, that the, they have really lived up to the spirit of that? Unfortunately, no, we don't. Um, 609C of the RFI, RFA does allow an agency um, to reach out to small businesses, but we don't feel that this um, relieves them of their duty to hold us a briefer panel. And outreach is not, as I said in my testimony, outreach to small business is not the same thing as a briefer panel. And the advantages of the panels that you don't get from outreach are pre, at the pre-proposal stage, you have the three-member panel, our office, EPA, and the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs at the White House. And at the end of the process, you end with a panel report that has the recommendations from actual small businesses on various alternatives that get put into the docket. I will add another question to this, this round, if I can, since I think we have got a little time here. Um, Section 317 of the Clean Air Act requires EPA to complete an economic impact assessment for any regulations propagated under Section 202 of the Act, uh, which applies to the CAR rule. Did EPA conduct a Section 317 imp uh, economic impact assessment before any of its greenhouse gas rulings were made? It, it did conduct a regulatory impact assessment associated with the light duty vehicle rule. If so, did the analysis, the analysis assess the following, which are required by statute, the cost of compliance? Yes. The potential inflationary or recessionary effects? I believe so. The effects on competition with respect to small business? Uh, the rule exempted small business, uh, Mr. Issa, so we probably did not need to go into much detail there. Do you intend on always exempting small business? No, when it is appropriate, we do. No, no. In, do, you, do you expect that this rule would never change, that in some future time you wouldn't do it? If, we, if the rule changes, we will have to go through a rulemaking process. So you carved, out small business, you carved out small business in order to essentially keep yourself from having to do that assessment, or that assessment simply wasn't necessary and that was never part of the consideration? That was obviously part of the regulatory impact assessment was to look at all costs. What I am explaining to you is that we well, did not The reason I ask the question is business. you don't exempt anybody without a reason. Obviously, we don't want clean air and clean water only for big companies. We want yes. clean air and clean water. So in your decision to exempt small business, wouldn't you need a cost reason to do so? Actually, uh, we, we did provide a thorough assessment of why it was appropriate to exempt. Cost was part of the consideration. Lead time was part of the consideration uh, because you were asking significant improvements in cars and many of the smaller uh, manufacturers would not be able to produce and comply with the rules. In, in, a, in the same way that large industries or large manufacturers were okay. able to do that. The next test was the effects on consumer costs. Did you take that into consideration? Yes, we did. The effects on energy use, did you take that into effect? Yes, we did. To the extent that EPA has conducted any economic impact analysis, I respectfully request that you provide that to the committee. Are you prepared to do that? Oh, we certainly will. Okay. I would very much appreciate it. That, in our opinion, has uh, been requested previously and is long overdue. I am getting head shaking. Uh, Christina? Sorry, 
Am I wrong? We have requested that. Okay, I think if you look through the series of letters, you will find that that was certainly something we had expectation of getting. We haven't gotten, but I appreciate your willingness to give us to us today and yield back. Thank you, Chairman. It, it is part of the rulemaking that, that is public information and is in the docket. Uh, thank, thank the, uh, the Chair. Uh, the I, just, I just have one other question, um, and we will be happy to yield back if the Chairman has anything additional. Um, in your testimony, uh, Ms. Rogers, you indicated that the panels work. Yeah. The panels work, and it's and and you have a, you feel like you got a good relationship with uh, Ms. McCarthy and, and anyone and everyone else that you you work with there. Um, it, it's a process that that makes sense and that has been effective. Uh, Ms. McCarthy, would you agree with what Mrs. Rogers' testimony, what she said in her testimony, that these panels work and that it is in the, it's it's a good process? Our relationship works very well. I would I would submit to you that we both are extremely concerned that EPA get appropriate information and feedback on small businesses and impacts to small businesses relative to those that we are regulating through a rule, yes. But to the specific question, the Sabrifa panels work. The process works. Uh, it has worked very well, yes. Okay. Now, so I come back to what I asked you earlier. A rule of this magnitude, in light of the debate that took place in the United States Congress dealing with cap and trade. Um, something, this issue that has been front and center uh, for the American people, a process that you both indicate works. Why didn't you follow it for something, again, of this magnitude, of this importance, with the debate the way it is, with the concerns expressed by small business owners in front of this committee today? It, 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 and I, look, I understand, you know, hindsight is 2020 and all that, but if you had it to do over again, would you, have, would you have convened the panel and went through the normal process? Let me explain to you. If Can I you could. answer that question? If you no, had it to do no, over I again? I would not. I would do it exactly the same way. Okay. And, and that is because the, these panels are designed to address issues relative to a rulemaking that sets a standard or establishes a requirement on a business sector, a small business entity. They are asked specific questions like, what is the reporting and record keeping and compliance? What are the Federal rules that might duplicate it? What alternatives do you have to the proposed rule? We did not enjoin a panel because the rules that you are talking about did not immediately or directly regulate small business. Well, wait, 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 so there was no way in which we could apply this You just said you had a great relationship. Ms. Ms. Rogers is an intelligent lady. Her right. folks who work for her are intelligent people. Mm -hmm. They suggested that you do it. So you may not have thought it was absolutely necessary, but why not do it again when they are saying this makes sense to do, when business owners are saying it makes sense to do? We have heard testimony of the concerns they have. Why not just do it? Why not be, why not be safe rather than sorry? On the tailoring rule, we did a voluntary program where we had an outreach with 23 SERs. We had a panel. We got their input. What we are not agreeing to is that this, this rule, and there is a requirement for panels to be developed when we have a rule like the endangerment finding that isn't directly re regulating small businesses, like the tailoring rule that is deregulating small businesses. It doesn't mean we don't appreciate the input of small business, and we try to get that input into the process. Ms. Rogers, you, you understood when you suggested the panel that the EPA could, in fact, take the route that they took. Yes. You understood that? Yes. You didn't yes. think it would happen because it is out of the norm. Exactly. Right? But you, you thought, well, maybe, and you, yet you still said this is important to have this panel. G give me the, in, in a few, why you, were so, why you were so focused on that and why you have expressed um, comments after the fact why it was important to have that panel. I would be happy to. One of the reasons, um, the endangerment finding, no, it did not directly regulate small businesses. However, it did set the greenhouse gas regulations in motion. Right. It did you, The foreseeable impacts of, uh, impact of these rules on small businesses certainly were there. Uh, the next rule to come about was the vehicle emissions rule, of course. Um, they were regulating large automobile manufacturers. However, just by beginning that process and starting to regulate greenhouse gases under the Clear Act, Clean Air Act on one part of or one, one part of the Clean Air Act automatically triggered the greenhouse gas regulation or, or regulating greenhouse gases under the entire Clean Air, Clean Air Act, thereby subjecting small businesses to permitting requirements under uh, the Clean Air Act. So you could foresee the, what was coming. Why couldn't they? I 
don't, can't answer that question, but I can, what I can say is by not holding. And it was clear. Did you have any in, in, in your your uh, your team who suggests this? Was there any disagreement as to uh, did, did, was it unanimous? We need to we need to move with this panel. It was unanimous. Yeah, so it was strong. You had to do this. Yeah. Yeah. You could foresee what was coming. Yes, we could. And you've proved right based on the testimony we got from the first panel. We think we have. Yeah. yeah. And yet they just couldn't see it. Unfortunately, no. Okay. See, we have no further questions for the, uh, for the panel. I want to thank you both for attending today. And again, I want to apologize for the schedule. We will look forward to visiting again. We are adjourned. <laughs>